September 14th, 2015, started off the way uh, most of my Mondays start off. It seemed unusual. We left late as usual, and I came into work late as usual the next day. I woke to find an email to the detector characterization. I arrived with this first email, followed by others, that confirmed that there was something important, at least. My first reaction was, it must be a blind injection. The observing rung is not even started. Uh, my first reaction was, well, this is probably a blind injection. Dear crew, begins our director's email. We LIGO members are having a special meeting. Do you mean to say that this was not a blind injection? E o sinal de gorjeio no espectrograma do canal gravitacional, que era aparentemente idêntico em ambos os detectores. By the end of the day, I was convinced that we were on to something uh, pretty interesting. LIGO might have detected gravitational waves from a pair of merging black holes. There were no injections, and I got chills. And the plot showed a very nice in spiral in both LIGO detectors. And as soon as I saw them, I knew that we detected a black hole merger. It looked just like numerical relativity simulation. Tálcán kínált volt, mint a csak kiabált volna, hogy itt vagyok. Signal был слишком сложный, чтобы быть случайным, и очень похож на тот, который ожидался от слияния компактных массивных объектов. We could be looking at gravitational waves for the very first time. Disbelief, um, constantly, if anything, trying to prove ourselves wrong, trying to pick apart this signal. This seemed to be an extraordinarily clear, well-defined response. It was simply amazing. I remember thinking, okay, wow, this is real. vividly sort of seeing something very strange. I thought it was very peculiar. They had, you know, they, they, this, this standard thing about, you know, this particular instrument needed that, this particular action was going to be taken. It, but then there was a, a entry made that says, we're going to stop doing, we're not going to have the, the fix it morning on Tuesday, which is the morning that always was used to fix problems that you saw over the week. And I said, why? I said to myself, what's going on? Then I saw another thing which says, well, you know, don't touch anything on that piece of instrument because it's important that we don't change anything. And that made me very suspicious. What the hell is going on here, you know? <laughs> and so uh, then the next thing that happens, I get a note from, um, from Dave Shoemaker, uh, which says, uh, are you aware that, that there might be, have been something detected? Is is that an hardware injection? Because you know you have to know that we routinely perform hardware injection in the data to test that everything works all right end to end. On the computer, I showed him the curves of the. We, we did have by that time um, some of the actual waveforms, was well, the wave from from Livingston and the waveform from Hanford, and the fact that you had to slide those two waveforms relative to each other to get them to be coincident, and on top of that, you had to flip the waveform over from Hanford, and then you got the thing to really register properly. All the little nuances, all that. And it looked like you were seeing the same thing in both places pretty damn well. So I woke up, and as every other day, I looked at the phone first and checked emails. A colleague of us from Germany um, had circulated an email to the old LSC saying, we saw this in the data from last night. It's a remarkably clean event. It seems to us that it was not a signal intentionally injected to test the, the pipelines. Can you please confirm that indeed there was not such injection? 
And uh, as the results start getting in, it looks like a binary black hole. Like, it looks it's beautiful. I was pretty sure that there were no injections just because we were not ready to perform such injections. And so I start actually hitting on my husband and say, hey, hey, wake up, wake up. Go look at the data, look at the data, because there's something big going on. So, you know, I woke up in the morning with Lisa kind of hitting me and saying, hey, there's, there's something interesting in the data, maybe you should go take a look. Uh, and, and so I went to start looking at, at the signals uh, from the interferometer to see if there was anything curious going on. Maybe someone was doing a test at 2 a.m. to be you know, not totally unheard. It's there, it's the perfect mass, the perfect signal, and, and I thought, well, Let's see what happens. Um, in this case, since there was no blind injection opportunity, I even knew the injection software wasn't working properly, so they couldn't have made a blind injection in the right way. I was uh, just coming back from a lecture, and, uh, and I see this email from Gabriela saying, the signal that you just saw reported in the online search is not an injection. <gasps> This is real. <laughs> this is real. Yeah, I, don't know if I saw the trace uh, of the event um, and immediately said, "This is real." One of the things that we're trying to do is identify a number of different types of signals. So, a very common one that we've now detected multiple times is binary black holes. Two black holes that are in an orbit around each other. And they make a very distinctive signal as they get closer and closer to each other and eventually merge and then ring down like a bell. <clears throat> and we search for these by looking in the data for signals just like those. The very most important thing that made us conscious of this whole thing that it was important to look at was the fact that it was true at both sides. If that wasn't there, I don't think we would have paid any attention to it. And the fact that the waveforms were virtually identical at the two sides was, I think, for most of us, the dominant reason that we took this seriously. After I woke up in the morning and did sort of the first initial checks, people started asking more detailed questions. And so I started looking you know, at more and more places in the data to see you know, what could have happened. Is there any way that this could be something other than a gravitational wave? The first thing you have to convince yourself of is that you really saw something and then you have to convince yourself that it wasn't anything other than a gravitational wave. Say, okay, let's not assume anything. Assume that you know, anything bad could have happened, some strange bug could have caused this. Allow for any possibility. I just won't use the digital control system. I'll build a model of it. And then by reproducing its behavior, I should be able to predict the output that it produced. You're trying to convince yourself that some external force, external influence, caused the signals that you see in those two detectors at the same time. That it's not just a chance bit of noise here and a chance bit of noise here, but it was something from the outside world that caused those signals in the detector. One of our jobs is to try to identify ways that the detector makes signals that look something like this and take those out of the data. Maybe we find uh, that there's say a little machine, a little, little machine out here, a little air compressor pump, and um, every once in a while this turns on and when it turns on it, it vibrates, and that vibrates and shakes the mirror a little bit, which gives us a signal like this. So we might be able to fix that by putting rubber feet on the machine, working with the folks on site to make sure this happens. But another way would be that we identify things in the data that are clearly caused by um, noise coming from the outside, so maybe we measure the shaking of this thing with a little sensor, like an accelerometer that measures how much the ground is moving, and then we find that the accelerometer records a signal that looks almost exactly like the signal that we have in the data, and we can match them together. Every time we see one of these in the data, we also saw one of those, and then we can use the, the data coming out from this accelerometer to take things like this out of the data to make it cleaner so it's, we can more easily see the astrophysical systems. The second piece of this is to convince yourself that it wasn't something other than gravitational wave. And for that, that's where the art of the experimenter comes in. We've got a system of 
seismometers, accelerometers, magnetometers, wind meters. For things that are local, like a um, like an instrument like this switching on, you don't expect an instrument switching on all the way over here in Louisiana to go nearly as far as you can go across the United States and happen within the light travel time, within let's say about 10 milliseconds at Hanford. So the fact that we have two detectors means that we have a great way to discriminate things that happen locally from things that happen globally. So when you're looking for things that happen in both detectors, many of these local things just won't correlate with the other detector. So the fact that we have two detectors is a great way to get rid of events that happen locally like this. But then we had a very sinister idea, and which one has to take seriously in our, in our epic, that this might have been generated by an intruder into the computer system. So the detection committee, for example, recommended that the uh, detectors be kept in exactly the same configuration for a period of time. Was it possible that this could have been come in from the outside by a hacker? And so people went around and sealed the electronics so that nobody, so no hacker could go back in and remove some kind of a device if they'd planted a device in some of the electronics that caused this. They couldn't go back in and remove it so that we wouldn't be able to find it. We found that the analog signals that were ahead of making the digital frame, which had all the signals in it, had the signal in it. And in fact, you could propagate it all the way from the photo detector, looking at each stage all along the way, and each one would color the signal a little bit. Some would add little high frequencies, some would diminish some of the low, all of that was correct. And by confirming that those, that the inputs resulted in the outputs as expected, as if nothing had been added, I was able to show that really nowhere anywhere in the system, even by any strange accident or weird bug in the code, that there was no way anything could have been added in the digital system. It's being called the breakthrough of the century. Scientists confirmed Thursday gravitational waves exist. After the earth-shaking detection of gravitational waves in the U.S. Mahan Vyagyanik Einstein ne ye theory di thi ki antriksh ek jal ki tarah hai. Explain to me how gravitational waves work and how we're able to detect them. Breakthrough discovery could change the way we think about the universe. Oh my galaxy! We found gravitational waves! Ah! We? have detected gravitational waves. We did it. So on September 14th, 2015, the two LIGO observatories in Hanford, Washington and Livingston, Louisiana recorded a signal nearly at the same time, nearly simultaneously, and the signal had a very specific characteristic, characteristic of as time went forward, the frequency went up. And what was amazing about this signal is that it's exactly what you would expect, what Einstein's theory of general relativity would predict for two big massive objects like black holes in spiraling and merging together. 
the black holes are getting closer and closer to one another, the orbit is speeding up, and eventually they're going to merge. The, the event horizons are going to join, boom. They produce one big black hole, which relaxes, and you see a little bit of vibration there. So each of these black holes are about 150 kilometers in diameter, a little bit bigger than that. Take something that's 150 kilometers in diameter, pack 30 times the mass of the sun in that. Accelerate it to about half the speed of light. Now take another thing, 30 times the mass of the sun, accelerate it half the speed of light and collide them together. That's what we saw here. Uh, here's a Michelson interferometer, which is the device that does the measurement. We fire light from the laser into the system. Now this is the electric field in the light. The color is the intensity of the light. So you'll see where the color tells you where the light is. Right now, there is no light at the photodetector. That's the trap you've set for the, for the gravitational wave. And now the end mirrors begin to wiggle in the animation. And you'll notice light appears, disappears at the photodetector. That tiny motion and that fact, that light, the amount of light that goes to the photodetector is proportional to that strain in the gravitational wave. That's the method of the detection. Now, I wanted to play the gravitational wave for you to hear, but it's so short that it's just a thump. So what we have done is taken the real signal and shifted a bit in frequency, but it's still the real signal. Did you hear the chirp? There's a rumbling noise, and then there's a chirp. Whoop. That's the chirp we've been looking for. This is the signal we have measured. We live to have Einstein completely verified. We haven't verified wormholes and a whole bunch of other things that's coming. And, but to me, this is, uh, you know, I, as I say, I really would love to have been able to tell Einstein this story and watch his puss, what he looked like. <laughs> it's 400 years ago, Galileo turned a telescope to the sky and opened the era of modern observational astronomy. I think we're doing something equally important here today. I think we're opening a window on the universe, the window of gravitational wave astronomy. It's been a very long road, but this is just the beginning. This is the first of many to come. Now that we have detectors able to detect these systems, now that we know that binary black holes are out there, we'll begin listening to the universe. Until now, we have only seen warped space-time, as though we had only seen the surface of the ocean on a very calm day when it's quite glassy. We had never seen the ocean roiled in a storm with crashing waves. All of that changed on September 14. I'm struck by how this represents more than just a new generation of observation. It's seen our universe with new eyes in an entirely new way. father was in a post office in Port Charlotte, Isla. My family come from Isla. And there's like five people in the post office, a hundred people live in Port Charlotte. Mm -hmm. And someone asked my dad, so come on, they must have other signals, other detections, are they going to announce it? And before my dad could answer, a little old lady who was picking up the, her newspaper, a kayak, we call them in Isla, and uh, she said, for goodness sake, boys, they're still analysing the data, they can't tell us. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea how she knew.